and hello. Good morning. Hello. Hi. Morning and welcome to Let's Keep Chatting. Uh, we've extended our Let's Chat interviews from Diverse Two Beacons at Ember. So thank you everybody that was involved in our first lot of interviews. Uh, today we have Eats Reside Community Hub with us today and they're going to discuss what they do and you know how that how the, they've been involved with their community and the you know and being able to be there for them. So we have Karen and Ethan. Hi, Ar. Hi, Ar. So, can you just give us a brief outline of what the group does at the moment? Yeah, sure. Um, so, Eats for South, um, we have a community hub, a community garden, and an orchard, and um, normally we would have um, a focus on growing food, eating together and sharing food. Um, and the community hub where Ethan and I work a lot is um, really a place where people can come together and um, have community meals and they can do some shopping for their food um, and just get together really. It's a social place as well. Um, and yeah, obviously that's had to change a lot recently. So at the moment, what we're doing um, is providing emergency food parcels. So we're still sharing food, but it's just in a slightly different format than usual. Um, and the, the growing of food is continuing around the garden and the orchard. So people can't really come in and, and eat in your uh, shared space at the moment. That's not going to be possible, is it? Mm. No, it's a big loss. Um, our community meals was a big part of um, what would have gone on in the hub, and it's it's difficult to see how community meals will will restart. We will find ways, and um, you know there may be opportunities just to change it up a little bit. Um, but yeah, at the moment it's it's not possible to, especially in the in the space where we are at the moment, to do that. That's a shame, you know, that things have had to change, you know, because of, you know, this pandemic and everything and that every community group has to alter their situation or trying to help people and everything. So, do you feel like the people um, are still coming in? Like, you know, like how you say it's a, t you know, they could come up and take away. Do they? Are you still getting the same amount of people that are coming to the hub compared to what you had before? Yeah, um, it's it's difficult because we've had to actually physically close the doors to the public um, because of the physical space that we're in. We've, we can really only have two people in at a time, just with the social distancing. Mm -hmm. um, so we've had to share our food from outside. So we do still have a table outside where we can share things and people can get it on their way past. Um, but really, we've had to focus on just um, sharing our food through these emergency parcels, which is really through a system of people getting in touch with us in advance and sort of pre-arranging that pick up so they can either come and collect it from the hub or we can home deliver it as well, which is what we what we really focused on during COVID, obviously, because people weren't <coughs> out so much and um, we, we switched to home deliveries. Um, we have kind of tried to reduce that a little bit now that um, restrictions are lifting and people are able to get out and about a little more, although of course that might change again. Um, but at the moment, um, people can come and collect food, um, but it just has to be sort of in a prearranged basis. So it's not ideal at all. It's not what we wanted to do. It's not what we set up to do. But at the moment, that's just what we have to mm. do to, to keep being able to share food. So. So, so how how do uh, is it like you you focus on an area or do, do you have like um, uh, users that you knew before that you knew uh, that they most likely have difficulty in ac accessing free fo uh, fresh food or, or vegetables or so how do people find out and, uh, and uh, or is it like a, people that you already knew that would from before but that would be coming from community mails. 
Yeah, that's been a challenge to get the word out. But um, obviously, because we've got a community hub on the on the street, you know, it's um, it's quite visible. So the people in Recife would would probably know about us. And um, we've been there like four years now. So we do have quite a few regulars. We've got a, a large group of volunteers. And um, so a lot of people would have known about us and would have expected us to be doing something um, to share food throughout this time. Mm -hmm. um, but we've had to rely on our referral systems from other groups through the council, Fife Voluntary Action, and um, other, other agencies and support groups. But um, also we've done a lot on social media. We're always on social media and we've got our website and um, we've done a poster campaign. We've also um, started a, a helpline um, since COVID, which has been really helpful. So people, um, especially, Ethan, I'll explain a bit more, but um, we've had to move Francis um, and likely be moving again. Um, and so it's wow. good to have a helpline for people to keep in touch with us to find us <laughs> because we may not be where they're used to finding us. So um, it's been good that we've been able to do that so people can still access the service and get help with um, finding food, whether it's through us or through other groups we connect with or um, just if we can provide advice for people if they're struggling financially or whatever, you know, that kind of thing. So that's been that's been useful. But yeah, it's, it's been a challenge without having that drop in kind of experience that we were used to. Yeah. That's good, though, that you're still there, you know, and help. But it's a shame that your group has to have altered so many aspects of what you're aiming at. Yeah. To like like be able so to be there. Yeah, we've just had to change to make sure that we're able to still operate in some way and help people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you do do share with us uh, the phone line as well. I'll make sure that yes. it actually appears uh, when we publish yep. uh, sure. the podcast and everything. That'll be really important. But so you started it at, during the lockdown. That must have been like really <laughs> quite. It, it's not easy to set up a phone line, so it must have been really tough. So, uh, so. Uh, is it open uh, during the week? Uh, how does it work? Let's talk a bit more about it because I think a lot of people would like to, to learn from it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's nothing fancy. It's just it's just a new mobile number. But for us, mm -hmm. it was um, it was crucial during those first few weeks, you know, um, mm -hmm. and um, it, it helped to keep our we had regular team meetings and we would keep in touch if if people were trying to contact us, we would have little discussions about what the best way we thought we could help that person. Um, and it just at the moment um, we're operating Monday to Friday. Mm -hmm. um, at the beginning of lockdown, we we did do Saturdays as well, but it was a wee bit much for the team and the volunteers. So Monday to Friday, um, and the hub there's someone based still at the hub ten till two Monday to Friday. So you can still go and chat to someone in person, but you know it just has to be at a distance. And we really just try and just do it at the doorway kind of thing. So it's not ideal. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, the, the phone line is there um, just so if anyone um, is trying to arrange for a food parcel or if they're just trying to find out some more information of other things that they need help with, um, we'll try to put them in touch. Has there been more of an increase in people, you know, coming to you for like help and everything? Yeah huge huge increase um compared to this time last year definitely um it's difficult to judge because previously people would come to us and they would be shopping and they would be picking up food um and you know there would be no real there would be no real need for them to disclose their circumstances we we are open to anyone um mm -hmm. regardless of income so people can come and just shop. They can get a little, or they can get a lot. If their if their cupboards are absolutely bare, they might sort of ask for a little bit extra or whatever. But there was never any need to um, explain circumstances or anything. And now it's become very much more of a, a food aid um, mm -hmm. situation. So um, obviously, the the numbers that we're seeing now, those are people who genu genuinely are in crisis or struggling to put food on the table. So um, to compare the numbers is quite difficult, mm -hmm. but, um, but we do um, work with um, IFAN, which is the Independent Food Aid Network, 
and we track the data through with them um, and similarly to lots of community organizations throughout Scotland and all of the Trussell Trust food banks the numbers have just increased like more than a hundred percent um so <coughs> last year so um emergency food aid is is going up all the time at the moment which is not a great situation um and there's many many reasons for it but um yeah we're we're definitely busier we've i'd say we've would you agree ethan it's slightly calmed down um now like from the from the peak of covid mm -hmm. earlier in the year demand was a lot higher but yeah it seems to have gone down a little bit but i think that is probably because people are um able to be back at work and restrictions have lifted a little yeah so as um what kind of groups like does businesses and everything you know what type of businesses get have been able to donate or get involved with your group to help you along the way along this way um well we we have a regular supply of surplus food from loads of different businesses loads of supermarkets um smaller shops uh, allotment owners donate food to us Re local residents donate food to us stuff that they've maybe bought that they don't think they're going to use so we get our food from all sorts of um different areas um and we've been really lucky that that supply has continued the whole way through lockdown there's not really been any time when we've struggled to access any any food and um you know for three more than three years there we were surviving just on surplus we never really purchased food um there's so much food waste and that was really one of the intentions of the project initially that we've never had to worry about our supply of food mm -hmm. um but during lockdown we wanted to <coughs> We wanted to obviously give people like a, a really well-rounded parcel so we wanted to make sure that we included food from every food group and make it nutritionally balanced make sure there's plenty of fresh fruit and veg in it so we did we had to we had to buy a lot of our stock in the past few months and we've had to also buy things like toiletries and cleaning products which we never necessarily would have shared before on mm -hmm. a regular basis so we've had to really invest in that side of it um, because you know people who are struggling financially now they're not just um missing the food you know it's every aspect of every, what they mm -hmm. need to get by so we have, we've had to really increase that um, Do, so could I, you give a bit of a background about how your group started and and what you were doing initially so that there's a bit of understanding about how how different it is now kind of thing that'll yeah. be quite good yeah I'll let him do that i've done enough talking <laughs> <laughs> yeah go on then <laughs> Um, yeah, the, the group started uh, well before I joined. Um, it's it's a few years old now, uh, but started off as a as a, a community led project that was that kind of wanted to encourage um, community growing, um, getting people to get involved in in growing food and sharing food, and uh, yeah, just a just a very organic, um, pure community project, um, and managed to acquire a couple of bits of public land in Rosyth, um, fortunately right in the centre of Rosyth really, uh, which which unless you notice the gates um, where, where the, our garden and orchard are, um, you'd, you'd never know they were there, but there are two lovely big um, plots of land that we've been able to, uh, that, that people involved with the project from the start and volunteers and, and everyone's been able to cultivate and turn into beautiful spaces. Um, but as Karen said, um, we opened up the the hub now just three years, Karen, did you say? Yeah, maybe a bit more. Uh, three and a half ish, yeah. Yeah. Um, and and that that uh, like Karen said came about a, because of a of a desire of an aim to um, to cut down food waste and sort of a, you mm -hmm. know cut down the limits on our environment that, that food waste has. Um, so it became uh, it became a, a place where people could come and, and get food for free or for a donation but just just a food sharing uh, place the community hub because uh, of course food waste is terrible i think recent stats say it's around 
every household is around 850 pounds or something like that per year easily that's the average wasted every household so yeah so that, that's more or less what you were tackling at the start or, or was it or, did, or were you like really we want a piece of land where we can grow kind of thing that, that a lot of uh, um I, th I think karen am i right in saying it started off that way as a more more like a community kind of growing project but right the okay food waste um ambition sort of came out uh as, as a result of that karen yeah um i think once we once we had the space and once we started growing it we obviously didn't want to waste what we were growing so we had to make use of all the fruit and veg that we were growing so it became a space where we could share that but at the same time because we were trying to um, reduce carbon emissions in, in the area, the reducing food waste by sharing any kind of surplus or anything that could be going to landfill, that, that became one of the initial motivators mm -hmm. for the project. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, and, uh, and talking about food waste specifically, if, um, just to paint a picture, I mean, I mean it's, it's probably no surprise that the, one of the things that, um, that we try and share the most and what we get the most of is, is bread, for example. Um, so much bread gets, gets wasted by supermarkets and stuff like that. We we take in dozens and dozens of kilos every week, um, and unfortunately, even though we're giving it away, we're still not able to uh, get rid of it all. So we we are wow. even seeing food waste from the food waste, if that makes sense. Um, so that's that's an example of like the the, the kind of challenge uh, well that's been there since the inception of the of the community hub of that that side of the project. Um, but yeah, it's uh, so so now three and a half years on from the, the from the hub's inception, um, and since I've been there, which is about a year and a half, um, it has got busier and busier, and and, um, and really, really our, our hub, our shop, um, it it really did become a, a busy a busy little place where. Um, Quite often through the day or at a community meal, you'd you'd literally be rubbing uh, rubbing elbows with people. Um, it it we we were sort of uh, achieving our ambitions, I think, of, of making it a community space um, for people to come in and 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 do their shopping. Um, we 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 always use the uh, the phrase or um, try and encourage people by saying uh, shop with us first, so that, mm -hmm. so that before they go to the shops, they see what they can get from yeah. us. And then, mm -hmm. and then, obviously, cut down waste in that respect. So we had shoppers coming in, and um, uh, ever-growing uh, number of volunteers. Who, um, you know, it was always brilliant to get as many people involved from the community as possible um, in 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 all sorts of uh, roles and helping out however um, however they could. Um, yeah, and then and then COVID came, and it, and it basically took it away overnight. Um, which is uh, obviously obviously rubbish for us uh, mm -hmm. as a project as a project, but the amount of people I think that's that's impacted um, unfortunately is is is. Uh, is so how many volunteers did you have? I mean, before we saw we saw that happened. Well, I think across the project, well over a hundred. Am I right? Yeah, there's probably there's probably about eighty core volunteers and wow. about half in the garden and half in the hub. Yeah, and and like Karen said, that that our hub space is um it's probably what ten by twenty feet of of actual space there in yeah, front of the right. kitchen. It's a it's a tiny little place, and um, I guess well that's not really social distancing. Isn't it? <laughs> no, that's right. <laughs> um, yeah, and it it did before COVID. It it, it became it became sort of like uh, we actually had to sort of like talk to volunteers and, and, and visitors and say like uh, we need to be mindful of how, how many people can be in here at one time you know because it, it became such a positive um, public space for people to come and um, have a chat and have a cuppa and, and um, just just spend a bit of time um, so going from that and like I say literally overnight to a place where we had to close the door and say we, we, we can't have anyone in here because you're not supposed to be within you know just um, well, it was, it was brutal, really. Uh, and now we're back to a position of where we, you know, just looking forward and hopefully that will change again. Mm -hmm. So you can't really meet outside as well because that doesn't really work for that space, does it? 
Well, it, it's good that we have the garden and orchard um, there because we, now, obviously, we are with restrictions being a little bit relaxed um, since since obviously March time, uh, we, we're able to have people come in and work in the garden and orchard or just go there and, and um, you know, have a chat, have a cuppa or whatever and just use the public space. But in terms of the hub, um, which, as I say, was 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 madly busy um, before, um, there's there's no alternative for that. Uh, and and I think I think linked to that as well, it's it, one thing that's frustrating for us um, is that, like I say, we, we we always encouraged it to be a space for for everyone in the community, not not just for people that needed help or you know could you, you know could could use some uh, some cheap food or whatever. Um, genuinely, a place where anyone could come, and, and and the ambition was to to reduce food waste, which is not just a ambition for. Uh, a few people hopefully would be an ambition for a lot of people and um uh to um to become what we have now over this crisis um is frustrating because we we've now sort of gone back to being a place where people only get in touch with if they need help now um I see what you mean. And, and i can imagine that um there are a lot of people that used to come in and, and do their shopping um and even though we're sharing surplus from outside the shop and stuff like that, I, I can imagine there are people that, that hold off because they think I, I shouldn't go there because they are helping people now. Mm -hmm. um, and that's frustrating because, like I say, um, we've for a long time trying to trying to push the message that we are for everyone. And now it's kind of like we're, we're being restricted. So from, you, you from managed to remove these barriers, but now you think yeah, there's like a stigma yeah. that kicks back in again. You think. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's pretty, ter it's pretty terrible, you know, that that stigma has to come up because of virus. Yeah. You know, because you were able to knock it down, kind of thing, within your community, and now it's the walls been like been put back up against between people. But it also seems that you know, like before the, the virus. Uh, affected everyone you know um, you were able to get the community just to talk to each other you know didn't matter uh, who you were you know people were talking you know being involved in things and expressing how they were feeling and everything and that and now that has sort of been taken away because of not being able to get into the hub properly but uh, with the garden being open and the orchid being open, you sort of still got it, but with the hub, it seemed that you were more more people got involved with talking, to you, you know, being there and just having a wee chat about something. Yeah, and I and I would say that the um, one thing to sort of note there is that while we have a a lot of people visiting our garden and orchard now, maybe it's not it's not necessarily the same people that were visiting the hub frequently. Mm -hmm. um, there are definitely people that go that, that used both sides of the project or you know um we engage with both sides of the project but um i think there's a great number of people that because the hub's not open they don't they don't make the trip anymore so they're not they're, there's definitely a, a good number of people i think that that are not uh engaging with the project now because the hub is closed uh or close to the public as it were no, it's a shame. Yeah, we will. We will find a way around it. I mean, we're we're we are seeking premises that is bigger, <laughs> so that we can uh, move a bit more and have a few more people in indoors and things. Um, so that's one side of it. But I think um, we'll we'll find creative ways around it. I, I'm sure we will. Um, mm -hmm. And as with all community food projects at the moment, everyone's trying to find ways to to continue their work because um, the food issues are only going to get worse now with people losing their jobs, um, mm -hmm. you know, furlough ending and um, redundancies. It's just, it's going to get more compounded. So we're all going to have to adapt and find new ways to, to keep sharing food. Um, we're part of, we're also part of a group who work in, it's called Dignity in Practice, and it's about just how to embed that in whatever you're doing so whatever service we've continued to run through this we've tried to keep that in our minds so mm -hmm. i think even though the service has been very much restricted 
we're trying to make sure that we don't forget about how how to treat people and how to try and make sure that whatever way we're delivering it is done without that stigma without the stigma of um mm -hmm. you know only being able to afford so much or having to to come forward and ask for help and make that an awkward situation you know we're, we're always constantly trying to think of ways to to make that less difficult for people um so yeah um we'll we'll keep we'll we'll just have to keep thinking about that so i'm guessing you a big focus now is just food parcels really that's yeah that becomes like more or less how we can help people when you can leave something that uh yeah will help people in the situation and and you, and you see you, you're throwing extra things there so uh, so this is a bit of a question because i'm curious i am very curious but uh, we, we know that there's a lot of people that aren't necessarily very savvy in terms of you know might might be using the internet or trying to find out what what's going on and uh, we we know we, we've had to find workarounds and and sometimes you got like uh maybe other people who are suffering from dementia or it might be uh, people with communication uh, kind of like challenges, barriers, it might be a different language or, you know, PSL. So how, 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 how can we work with that? Have you had any situations like that? You think, and you go like, okay, we need to find a work around. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. We have these situations come up quite regularly. Um, um, but I think one of the, one of the main ways around it for us is really just to make sure that we've got some partner groups that can help us. Um, so at the moment we've we've been working with a group um, from Alzheimer's Scotland um, and the, there was a group of people with Alzheimer's and their family members who would come to the garden regularly and they would take part in some gardening activities or um, occasionally they would go to the library to, to work together in the bad weather, that kind of thing. And that, that has managed to continue um, a lot of it has had to be done online, obviously, but um, mm -hmm. that group is there help, you know, help in that group. And um, we've also had some families, we had um, some Romanian and Bulgarian families get in touch needing food over the past wee while with very little English. And um, we had to communicate through their neighbours, but also we got Fife Migrants Forum involved and um, they were able to keep in touch with the family and make sure that they were telling us, how, you know, whether they still needed food. Um, they had babies in the family, so we had to keep in touch to find out, you know, what what kind of requirements they had for the babies. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's it's also about the kind of support you give you. It's not like yeah. the books that we work for everyone. That, that doesn't. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's that's been a really big challenge for us. I think that's been. It's been quite demanding, but what we've been trying to do is try and figure out the needs um, of the people who are receiving the parcels so that they can be kind of personalised, which is is something that um, in the hub situation would be quite easy. You could just have a conversation, say what do you like, what what you're allergic to, you know, that kind of thing. But when you're doing things long distance and maybe through a third party, that can become quite difficult. Okay. But um, but we think it's worth it. We think it's worth the extra effort to try and um, get nappies that fit the kids, that get the right foods, and you know, um, it just all it takes a bit longer and a bit more resources. But um, I think at the end of the day, people people need these things, and they come forward to us because they can't get them themselves. So yeah, mm -hmm. we've we, we've had um, some families with. Um, no recourse to public funds as well so um and that has been another challenge just um when we're trying to maybe phone around a few different services to get them help and financial support and it's just it's barrier after barrier you know um, mm -hmm. so again i think um our phone line was was there so that we could take some of that pressure off people so that we could maybe do the the phone and round and trying to find the help for people um, so yeah, there's there's a few different groups, and I think really working with the partners is the only way because we're not experts in that. You know, we're not experts in in um, all of these different areas, so we just really have to rely on on other groups helping us. Mm -hmm. and, and we've been we've been quite lucky that way. Um, it's great to hear, actually. I mean, we, we've seen a lot of groups that have 
basically had to engage with a group that, well, they wouldn't because everyone just manages around. But, mm -hmm. but now it, it's just has to happen. It's just happening. So, so that's a positive side of things. And so, yeah. But I also think that growing food tends to have a, a really positive impact on most people once, once you get into it. And uh, so it, can people still come and, and help it grow or is that unfortunately stopped as well? Or? Um, yeah, people can come and volunteer. We um, we would ask them to um, sign up and register with us as volunteers just so we can keep track of, of numbers and make sure that people are looked after but yeah they can they can volunteer um there's social distancing in place in the gardens obviously and there's um you know some ppe requirements that kind of thing we we just have to be mindful of that wherever we are now don't we so yeah but in, <laughs> Not the choice. But, yeah we definitely see um we definitely see the value in um growing your own food benefits to your mental health benefits to being outside um, and Ethan's just recently actually made a little video with one of our volunteers, which um, really sums that up. I, I don't know if you can get a chance to see it sometime, but it's really worth seeing um, about the impact of being outside and, and growing food and how that can help people. And I'll make sure to share it. Uh, yeah. Is it available on your website? I'll, I'll make sure it's added to this recording yeah yeah we can send you a link um it's it's, it's on youtube and on our on our um, different channels yeah excellent yeah. yes in, in terms of the garden as well it's worth saying that if, if if people are interested in um coming along and seeing what goes on and, and and helping out and like you say growing and learning um we we do have uh, a couple of staff members who are who are gardeners um and they are they're obviously there to, to manage and, and lead the project uh, in those outside spaces so it's not like a it's not like uh, you come along blind and just sort of like well, you'd, you'd be you'd be led and um, and uh, like gardening. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you'd you'd, you'd 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 be taught um, you'd taught whatever's necessary and, and kind of be led down that path. So um, so yeah, if people are interested, it's, it's, it's definitely a positive thing, especially at the moment if people want to get out and about and do that kind of thing. What kind of stuff do you grow? I mean, a lot of people. Just don't know much. I, I know a bit about community gardens, so, but I've got an idea. But yeah, do, do talk a bit about what, what you grew in your, you know, on your site. Um, well, uh, we, so in when when we talk about the community garden and, and our garden and orchard are basically opposite each other on, on on the other sides of the road, sort of thing. So they're very close to each other. In our in our community garden, it's it's pretty much what you'd expe expect from from a food garden. Um, so lots of uh, Lots of normal vegetables, potatoes, carrots, and cabbages, and um, uh, so, some some more interesting things as well. Like uh, there's a greenhouse there. There's there's grapes growing there, and um, chilies, and um, uh, so there's, there's all wow. sorts as well as well as as well as lots of um, different plants and herbs, and um, the, there's always uh, a great variety of things being grown there. Um, but it's ma it's mainly food orientated in the garden. Whereas the orchard is is more, um, uh, dare I say, uh, more aesthetically like uh, it's it's, it's oh, a really yeah. beautiful space and um, all sorts of trees and uh, and beautiful flowers and plants and um, there's there's like a, a rock garden there and a butterfly garden we've got beehives up there as well. Um, wow. There's also there's also a classroom in the in the orchard which is. Um, you know, not 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 being used really at the moment because of obvious reasons. But uh, there's 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 a lot of potential for for people to come along and learn. Um, and um, yeah, I, it's it's a pretty comprehensive uh, outside space, really. The, through the garden, the orchard. There's there's uh, I'm I'm sure that even most people who might be really into their um, growing and gardening might might even be surprised about some of the things growing there and um, find it interesting. So. So the beehive, you know, does that mean that people are getting like fresh honey kind of thing? Yeah, not the... Normally, but for some reason, for some reason this year, the bees didn't manage to produce honey. Um, so it was a bit of a disappointment this year. But but ordinarily, yeah, the, it's a it's a kind of nice end of uh, end of season kind of uh, event to, to to see what honey's been um, accumulating. But um, unfortunately, not this year for whatever reason. I'm not sure. 
so do you have people like the the beehive thing totally interests me because I think there's a place up in Cooper that does something similar, you know. Yeah. And um you know, do you have some like if somebody that doesn't know nothing about bees but they want to go to this to see the beehive, do you have people like showing them how to like deal with everything and you know, get involved that Team good and everything. <laughs> there, we, we do have um, <laughs> John, who is one of our garden uh, project managers, um, is uh, has become very knowledgeable about, about beekeeping um, and obviously leads the way. And, and, and one of our volunteers, Carol Ann, um, both of those guys are, are kind of leading the, the bees, uh, as it were. Um, <laughs> it, it might not be, a, if you wanted to learn about beekeeping, you can certainly do it. I, it might not be a process of turning up on day one and getting in a, a suit and um, you know uh, oh. right into it. But it, but it, um, but I'm certain that, um, that that those guys would would willingly impart their knowledge. We've even got uh, like uh, beekeeping suits for kids and stuff. So oh, um, really? yeah, I, I think um, it's 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 definitely something that that can happen if if that's what people are specifically interested in. Then yeah. That sounds good. That sounds fun and everything. Yeah, everyone loves the bees and the school <laughs> groups. The school groups and stuff like, love to come and find out about the bees and yeah, they're they're quite fascinating really when you when you find out about about them and um and all the all the all the the way that the orchard's designed is you know it's there to help feed the bees and make sure that they're looked after and yeah we do have some really interesting. At the moment, there's some quince that's ready to harvest, and some uh, a really interesting fruit called medlar, a medlar tree. So they're they're quite strange, and they look like they kind of look like they're um, they're gone past their best. You mm -hmm. harvest them in November, and they're like dark brown color, and they look a bit off. But they're actually supposed to be like that, and you can scoop the inside out, and it kind of tastes like toffee apple or something. Wow. November, that's quite late for yeah. any fruit tree, yeah. really. So, mm -hmm. that, that, November, that sounds think. tasty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look, sounds, sounds like the item, the fruit looks disgusting, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you've got to be interested in the inside bit. <laughs> you have to try, you know. Yeah. Find out. I'm, I'm, I'm a really fussy eater, so you know. I'm <laughs> we, we like we like fussy eaters at our project. That's one of our challenges: is to help fussy eaters not be fussy. You have to taste lots of different things, and um, in our community meals, we'd always be um, trying to push the boundaries there and get people to try things. So, so <laughs> if, if someone asked for for a, a fruit parcel in November and they said, "Oh, go on then." Yeah, <laughs> Why not have a bit of a surprise? Because I mean, something that we've been talking about a project. It's like the food parcel. It's a good thing, you know. It's like it's 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 necessary because everyone is facing difficulty. It's quite good sometimes to have food that boosts your morale with something really nice, you know, something something like, a bit different. Yeah, yeah, something a bit different or like a special meal that you really like that you do once in a while. That kind of thing that just boosts your morale a little bit. So. Yeah, we try. We have tried to include some of our own homegrown produce in the parcels as much as possible. So I think that was nice. We were able to include like red currants and locally grown apples and pears and things. So that was nice. And uh, Ethan's also, he can tell you, he's been working on something called Easy Eats, our meal kits. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Um, so it's it's gone a gone a bit off the boil in the last uh, last few weeks. So like Karen said, we um, because we so. When lockdown uh, came in, we had to shut our hub door um, and we were kind of at a loss what to do really because we started, we, we obviously pretty quickly started coming up with the idea that we had to kind of deliver food to people somehow. So we started doing that in a small way from, from, the, from the hub, but it became obvious that we, we needed a bigger premises. So we were able to get a bigger premises from the council for a few months over this summer. Um, which was uh, massively helpful and let let us do so much um, during during lockdown. Um, uh, but um, so moving back to the hub now, uh, it, after we, unfortunately we had to move away from from that bigger premises and back to our hub. So that's why we're back there, and so that's why Easy Eats uh, these meal kits have not really um, 
taken place over these last few weeks, but uh, we did use the opportunity um, of lockdown and, and kind of delivering food to start making up simple meal kits with, with recipe cards and all the ingredients you would need to make that meal for, for four people. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and it, it, was, it, it was really good. So people could um, order them on our website um and we we had a kind of uh you know what i would say a, a very affordable price for each kit um it varied slightly depending on the kit and, and stuff like that but um yeah it, it became a popular thing where um yeah as, as the name implies we were delivering simple meal kits to people to to try out and when we tried to make it a little bit um a little bit interesting stuff so people could try something new and stuff and um and it was also dependent on stuff that we were getting in either from surplus or from uh, you know other avenues um you know getting our food resources in as we do through the week so it would be a pretty quick turnaround um between thinking that oh we've we've got this ingredient coming in this week what can we make a meal around that and um so you said yeah. it's difficult to do with premises so, so what kind of premises do you need you know i mean this is this is your podcast so yeah yeah what, what, what's important uh, maybe we can nudge someone and say look well, if he wants this, so what what would be of use? The, the, the number one um, the number one issue is 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 just space. And um, like I said, our the the hub that we worked out of uh, and, until COVID is an absolutely tiny space. And um, okay. it was it we 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 had been looking for a new premises well before COVID came along. Um, in fact, we'd been quite far down a path in terms of looking for funding and looking for premises and, and, and actively trying to move. Um, and then COVID came along and sort of stopped us in our tracks. And then and then it, it became a kind of, oh, we would like to move premises so for the good of the project. And it, it sort of became an issue like we need to move right now, otherwise we can't do much at all. Okay. Um, so we were able to borrow a, a community centre building, like a youth centre building from Fife Council and uh that that is a much larger space um and it allowed us to have uh allowed us to have tables of food spread out a across this kind of uh hall mm -hmm. um and our volunteers uh and and obviously us staff as well making food parcels up we could we could then go uh, along these tables and make up food parcels uh, easily seeing what ingredients like you know what what produce we had to make up good food parcels um in in a in a space like we've gone back to now that becomes much more difficult because stuff's crammed onto shelves obviously we we can hold much less produce now um okay and even having the food parcels there like ready to get collected or ready to get delivered like you basically um you know, it's, it's difficult to move. So, uh, so it's space really. It's not like a huge kitchen. So it's actually space to spread things out. Or yeah, kitchen, people... kitchen. Um, if we, if we manage to get a new premises anytime soon, then um, kitchen will be a priority because at, you know when we're able to, our community meals um, and our you know the cooking side of things is a, is a really big part of what we do. Um, not only to prepare meals ourselves, but also you know. The, the potential for getting people more people involved in cooking and learning cooking skills like karen um for example has, has done a huge amount of work uh teaching people different um kitchen skills and, and getting people to cook meals and, and learn more about um diet and 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 yeah just just generally eating uh better and um obviously if you've got a big kitchen then then the potential to get a few people in and and all preparing the same thing and learning different skills is is really important um so we would ideally eventually when we move uh we would have a really nice big kitchen that we could use for all sorts of purposes as well as a shop space as well as a space for tables like a cafe or restaurant type area as well so ideally we would have a nice big space where all these things sort of come together and and, and would allow us the freedom to kind of uh um well do all sorts to reach people in in all sorts of ways i think it's crossed yeah we'll, we'll, we'll include that on when we write where we blog about this it's like do you know yeah. of a space uh -huh. get in touch <laughs> <Ew. laughs> so um see for your cooking at the moment oh, yeah. um are you quite restricted by the amount that you're getting out to people currently yeah really um 
because there's only a couple of people allowed in at, at one time, those people are their times generally taken up with making up the food parcels and and then those food parcels take up all the space. So there's not really the the space to move around and cook as much. But, um, so as I said, we, we do have um, Brenda, one of our staff members, she does a lot of the cooking and at the moment she's cooking um, to include cooked meals in the food parcels that are going out through other pantries and, and we were doing it through our own parcels throughout the summer as well and um, she's cooked an enormous amount of food I think like there must have been I think the last time I counted like 4,000 meals or something um, which is impressive when you see the restrictive space we had to work with um, and yeah with really only one person allowed in the kitchen at a time it kind of restricts how much you can produce but yeah well, I think, got, so. I think we lost Lisa. You see, that's why there's two of us. There's always <laughs> internet connection that drops. So, but I've got one person cooked four thousand meals. She must be so tired. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, we had, we did have, we did have another another one or two people helping with the cooking, but um, just had to do it on different days and things. So, yeah. But um, Brenda's a bit of a legend in our kitchen. She's been doing our community meals for years and cooking for. Um, people, you know, two evenings a week, and she can she can put meals together really quickly. So she she needs a recommendation for a yes. volunteering recognition. Yeah, that, sounds, yeah. that sounds like a amazing amount of work to do. Yeah, we've got a lot of volunteers who who help with everything from the meal planning to the food shopping to the dishes to serving. You know, that it's it's a big team effort. But yeah, she does a lot of work. Wow. So what? So what? I mean, as I say, I'm full of questions. You never stop me. But what, what do you think of a? Oh, hello. Welcome back, Lisa. <laughs> just went and disappeared to be there. That's why. That's why there's two of us. <laughs> it's all good. It's, it's like diversity week. It's ah, uh, yeah. Just like you didn't miss me anyway. <laughs> uh, I was. I was going to move for questions. It's like um, so. What, what's the, the coming weeks or months ahead? I mean, it's a big, difficult question, but what, what do you think it's like? Because I know, uh, well, winter tends to be quieter in community gardens, obviously, because that's, that's different. So you tend to focus on other things. So what what, what do you you think uh, uh, the coming winter as well? Is it likely to be Especially like? Especially with Christmas coming up. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, well, there's, always work to be done at the garden whether no matter what season it is there'll always be stuff going on there so those guys will be going ahead with that um and you know they're they're doing lots of new creative things every time we go up there's they've been working on mosaics and willow dens and um, pond areas you know everything um so there's always lots of work to be done there and lots of preparation obviously for the next season you know um and for us i think we're we're you know, short term anyway, we're going to be concentrating on our food deliveries and our food parcels and um, and premises move, hopefully that kind of thing. That's going to keep us busy. Um, we're also we're also hoping to do a bit of online things. Um, so at the moment, we're taking part in these dignity and practice workshops where we're trying to work with other food organisations and other a lot of new pantries have just sprung up so we're just kind of trying to work with those people and share best practice and ideas and things that um we think can work um to to make sure that whatever food service we're doing has dignity at the heart of it mm -hmm. um, so that those workshops are ongoing and you can sign up for those that's one event that we can plug yes um, definitely. They're, they're being run in collaboration with nourish scotland and they're all on the nourish website Okay, yeah, there's quite a few dates between now and Christmas. Um, okay, we'll try so, the next. Yeah, yeah. We're also just to just to make the October holidays a little more fun. I've been working on a project to do with bread making. So, and that's in connection with Scotland the bread. So they make um, they grow their own wheat and mill um, their own flour in Bowhouse in St Monans. Mm -hmm. and um, they've been providing us with bread making kits that we've distributed to people in the area who are interested in learning how to make their own bread obviously 
bread disappeared off the shelves at the beginning of lockdown and a lot of people started making their own. So we thought we'd take the opportunity to um, get some of those baking skills up um, and just to try and get some good quality bread into the community and, and uh, those baking skills. So we're doing that this week. Okay. Um, and everyone has their own little kit at home and they've started to make their own sourdough starter culture and everything. So it's been that's been quite good fun. Um, and Just to make sure, this is like you're actually working with bread. You're not putting stuff in the bread maker. You're actually we're working. Making, yeah, we're yeah. making it from scratch with nothing but flour okay. and uh, water. <laughs> yeah, like, so. just, just to make sure, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We have enough surplus bread to deal with, but this is good quality, made from scratch. Yeah, um, so we're doing that. We're, um, I'm also starting to get involved in this Peas Please um, network, which is about um, encouraging people to increase their intake of vegetables um, and just trying to work with suppliers and supermarkets and producers just to find ways of getting, making vegetables easier for people to access and to include in their diet, so. Is that linked to VegFest thing? So that yeah, as part, showed me... please, I'm one of the, the members taking part in this VegFest, which is going on all this week. There's lots of interest in webinars and workshops online. You'll be able to find those if you look it up. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's just, it's a, uh, it might not seem everyone's cup of tea, but I guarantee if you, tune in you'll find something fascinating because food is um just at the heart of so many problems and issues at the moment and um there's lots of experts taking part in this festival who can uh, share their expertise about um improving the diet uh, the nation's diet improving access to food um tackling food poverty issues you know all these kinds of things so it's really interesting event that sounds really good. Definitely, yeah. we check. So it's this week. So yeah. we make sure to share it a bit ahead. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. That sounds really good. You know, with everything that you're involved with, and you know, and being part of other groups and everything. So for you, your big wish definitely is new premises. Is there anything else that you you like to have a word out? Are you looking for extra pair of hands for volunteers or a tree surgeon to to correct? The old church before it's really called. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just wondering. Yeah, yeah you, must, you, need, you need a tree surgeon. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure that would be welcome too. Any uh, any skills are are welcome. Um, yeah, always open to new volunteers. Um, at the moment, obviously, it's difficult to have people involved in the hub side of things. But as we open up that side of the project again, we'll certainly be looking for new volunteers for that as well. Um, but yeah, if you're interested in working outdoors and you're not afraid to be outdoors in the winter, then come Excellent. forward and uh, we'll we'll make sure that you you get involved and somehow and you're welcome to just come for a little visit as well. It's such a nice space just to pop in and, and see. So that people can just do that. go to the website and, and yeah. look for volunteering from there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And people are also... Um, they can get involved by donating, so you can donate food, uh, money, whatever. <laughs> but yeah, if you have surplus food um, or contacts with businesses that um, have food, local producers especially, you know, um, or if you grow your own at home and you've got too much, we can take that mm -hmm. off your hands. So that's another way people can get involved. Okay, okay, that sounds great. That sounds really good, you know, and it's good that you know you're part of this community that's, that's trying to help people you know and get people together so i think we're going to be coming to the end of our first interview for let's keep chatting so <laughs> thank you ethan thank you karen and everything and good luck with everything that you have been doing you know and hopefully you know you get a new premises you know a bigger one <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.